uh, why is actually constipation important for us to uh, learn? So constipation is a symptom that has uh, a lot of primary and secondary causes. And as discussed in our fatigue class, I have told you that primary causes are very less for fatigue and most of them are secondary. But for dyspepsia in the last class, penultimate class, uh, the secondary causes were very minimal and most of the causes were primary or functional dyspepsia. Similar to dyspepsia, constipation also, the primary or functional constipation is a lot in number compared to secondary causes and secondary causes more often than not present with a recent onset constipation that can be easily told by the patient as to when it began or it can be easily detected by few few basic tests few basic imaging tests and hence can be uh, more amenable to treatment than the primary causes so because they are detectable easily and they are told uh, by the patient as to when and what easily they're more easily detected and treatable but what lies as a most important majority are the primary or the functional causes which cannot be easily assessed or cannot easily be detected so today we'll be talking about how what is constipation and to know what is the bristol stool scale and uh, what is the physiology of the colonic motility and tone and the process of defecation and defecation reflex we're going to differentiate between what is called as recent onset and chronic onset constipation. So Harrison tells you there are two types of constipation. One is recent onset and one is chronic constipation. And in chronic constipation, which we're going to talk about in detail, we're going to detect what is chronic constipation and how it's uh, how they're classified into primary and secondary. And we're going to talk about what and all history points that are important for, for you to talk uh, take in a case in a case of chronic constipation. So this is the Bristol form scale, which is very important for us to uh, know before we head on, uh, which is seven types of stool based on the appearance. So type one is basically a separate hard lumps. They are not slick and they're hard to pass. Type two is basically uh, uh, lumpy, uh, but they're sausage shaped. They're all together. They don't have any particular uh, uh, disintegration. And uh, these two are actually uh, coming under the uh, uh, heading of constipated stools. So these are actually hard stools, let, uh, according to Harrison's and Slicinger. Type three and uh, four, four are basically normal. Okay. And type five, six, seven are going towards the diarrheal component or loose stools. So type uh, three and type four are basically type three is a, like a sausage, but with cracks on the surface. Type four is a smooth uh, snake like appearance. Okay. They're smooth and soft. Type five is basically. Basically, type 5 and type 6 are easily differentiated by the border. So the edges is very clear cut in type 5, whereas they're ragged in type 6. Okay. And they're both very semi-solid in nature. Type 7 is completely liquid and there's no solid component. There's not discernible. So 5, 6, and 7 are basically in the diarrheal end, whereas 1 and 2 is basically in the constipated end. So two, three and four are basically normal according to Harrison. So this is the Bristol stool scale, which is shown as a page, which is shown to the patient as a uh, picture for him to uh, diagnose and monitor. Okay. Let us take up some questions in the starting only, but we'll not go to the answer until the end of the session. So here is a 43 year old male uh, who is having difficulty passing stools with lump, lumpy stools and a lot of straining. There is no blood in stool or abdominal pain. There is no diarrhea or weight loss and often needs to use his finger to stimulate defecation. Okay. So uh, no drugs or any other systemic causes. So how do we approach to this patient? What type of constipation is it? First of all, is it co actually constipation? Uh, and how do you evaluate? Now, the patient, which is a 52-year-old male, presents with difficulty passing stools again once a week and tells that there are hard lumps. Bristol scale is one and there are no other systemic sign symptoms or drug intake. There are no red flag signs. There is no urge to pass stools and there is no straining also. There is no sensation of heavy perineum or a digital evacuation required. So these two patients are presenting in a different manner with different symptom complex. But at the end, they're going to come and tell you they have only difficulty passing stools. So difficulty passing stool, when told by this 42-year-old gentleman or a 50 of the second uh, patient, both, both are actually perceived, correct? So they are perceiving that there is some kind of a difficulty passing stool. So now they're going to come and tell they are constipated. So this is a perceived constipation, which doesn't necessarily actually uh, be under the definition of constipation that we learned. So definition of constipation is different from what the patient is telling. Patient can tell, but you have to go ahead and take further history and examination to differentiate between a subjective or a perceived constipation from objective. So subjective and objective. So the first thing to do in any patient with constipation because subjective patient need not necessarily have constipation could be normal also generally speaking less than three stool three stool movements uh, per week is considered to be constipation because most of the patients at least have three stools 
three stools per week. Most of the patients, uh, most of the most of us have three stools per week. So this is considered to be normal. Anything lesser than that is considered to be normal. But that is only by the definition of frequency. So frequency less than three is considered to be constipation. At the same time, one has to note that it is not just the frequency that is important, but also the type of stools, okay? The consistency or the type of stools. So consistency of the school, a stool is basically determined by the Bristol stool scale, which we know should be either one or two. They should be hard basically. So this is consistency of stool. So not only will you ask frequency, you will ask consistency also. Okay. Along with that, you're going to ask if the patient is having pain during defecation. Okay. So pain during defecation has to be asked. Along with it, this pain is basically due to straining. Correct. So basically, does the patient have to strain a lot to pass one little amount of stool? That is straining. Okay. He sits on the uh, uh, washroom and strains heavily. If he strains also, sometimes if he doesn't get, he uses digital manipulation. So he uses a finger to stimulate the anorectal region to uh, uh, aid in evacuation, aid in evacuation. So this is called digital manipulation. So is he using any digital manipulation? You have to ask him. Is he straining? You have to ask him. So this digital manipulation in females can be through the posterior wall of the vagina also. Because the vagina is abutting the rectum, so some patients can also use the uh, use finger into the vagina to stimulate the anorectal wall so that the sensitivity of the rectum bomb increases to the stool present and then evacuation happens. So some patients can need vaginal stimulation or they might need anorectal digital manipulation, okay? Uh, or they might require the support of the perineum. So supporting the perineum means actually giving hand the entire palm to the perineum in aiding for stool control. Most of the patients, what happens is either during the defecation reflex, the perineum bulges out completely, very much down, so that, that there will not be enough pressure in the rectum to aid in defecation. So these patients will push up the rectum to prevent that ballooning. So this perineum is supported. So basically there is a perineal muscle problem, perineal laxity that leads to the patient supporting the perineum. You need to ask whether he is supporting the entire hand on the perineal region to aid in evacuation. After this, you are going to ask one more symptom. So this is the first symptom complex, second symptom complex, third. Third, you're going to ask if there's any urge. So urge is basically the sensation of actually having to pass tools. See, frequency and straining pain, digital manipulation and urge. If the patient has urge, that means the patient has normal transit. So basically normal transit in the colon. Basically the colon is basically moving and propulsing the, uh, propelling the stool. Okay. So urge, if urge is present, basically uh, that means the uh, colonic transit is normal. If urge is not present, then that means that the uh, uh, there's a problem in the anorectal region. So you need to know whether there is a problem in evacuation from the anorectal region or there's a problem in the colonic transit. Okay. So these two are important. So this is anorectal evacuation. This is colonic transit. Both colonic transit and the anorectal evacuation will lead to propulsion of the stool, storage, and then defecation. Okay, now uh, we need to know basically uh, what is the physiology. So I have already spoken about uh, a little of it. Harrison's, basically all these words are from Harrison's again. So Harrison tells that uh, the ascending colon and the transverse colon is acting as a, acting as a reservoir. It is, a volition, it is not a volitional reser, uh, reservoir, but it is, uh, it is a non-volitional reservoir. Descending colon is a conduit. Okay, It's a conduit for the stools, whereas the sigmoid and rectum is a volitional reservoir. So these three things are important. So in the ascending and transverse colon, basically, it is going to take 15 hours for this passage of stool normally. Whereas in the descending colon, it is going to take about three hours because it's just a conduit. So it is just going to pass down. Whereas the sigma in the rectum is a volitional reservoir. It is going to go expand itself to a large extent to store and then initiate the process of uh, defecation. Now, colonic transit is based because of two things. One is the colonic tone and the colonic motility. Colonic tone is basically what is present in the wall of the pressure present in the co colonic wall at baseline. Over and above that, if there is a particular spike of contraction of more than 75 mmHg, they are called as high, high amplitude propulsive contraction or HAPSIs. So these 75 mm or more than 75 mm HAPSIs, if they're present on the basal tone, they're called as, that, that is the colonic motility that's going to take place. That is going to propel the stool. Okay. So there's going to be segmentation also it's be, between two hostels. This uh, uh, one segment of the colon is going to be uh, constricted and there's going to be mixing of stools inside the colon, aiding in water 
and sodium reabsorption. And mind you, Harrison's also always tells you that the colonic sodium conservation is very much uh, efficient uh, as comparable as the small intestinal. Because in some cases, when there is diarrhea or lo excessive loss of sodium or there's less dietary intake of sodium, the colon colonic mucosa aids in the absorption of sodium and preserving the sodium, serum sodium also. So colonic mucosa is actually quite active uh, in the terms that it reserves serum uh, sodium from the colon into the serum once there is some kind of a small intestinal enteritis or a small intestinal pathology. This is not the case for other nutrients, or not carbs or proteins or fats, but for serum sodium. It is as efficient as small intestine. So, uh, colonic tone and motility both together are going to store and then propel the stool forward. This is basically colonic transit. Okay, This is colonic transit. Now, um, if uh, basically uh, what is very important for you to know is the migratory motor complex that comes every 90 minutes in the GI tract usually ends around the small intestine. It never, uh, like, uh, rarely crosses the colon. Only in few conditions it crosses the colon. But migratory motor complex is a part that is mostly restricted up till the small intestine. Up till the small intestine, not going into the colon. Okay. So this is the physiology of uh, reservoir colonic transit. Uh, and now we come to the anorectal region. So in the anorectal region, what we do, what we have is evacuation. So these are evacuation. This is colonic transit. Okay. So both together will be coming under the constipatory problems. So in anorectal evacuation, you have an important muscle called the levator ani, which is the pelvic diaphragm and the puborectalis link. Now this puborectalis link is basically attaching from the pubis to the uh, anorectal junction. So it is basically normally only in a tonic contracted state to keep the anorectal angle. Okay. Around 90 degrees. Okay. What happens is during uh, rectal filling, once the rectum is completely filled up, this puborectalis will relax. So there's a relaxation of puborectalis. This relaxation of puborectalis causes the angle to increase by more than 15 degrees, by more than 15 degrees, going up till 110 to 120 degrees. So this angle is basically more straighter than the original angle. So because of this, the passage between the rectum and the anus is more easy. And then the external and the internal anal sphincter will relax, causing the stool to be evacuated outside. So this is the defecatory reflex. Okay. So this is the basic understanding. So in constipation, you have two things. One is colonic transit and one is anorectal evacuation. So if you're having a problem in the colonic transit, you're going to have some issues and they're treated differently. If you're having problems in the anorectal evacuation, you have some issues and you are treating them differently. So it is important to understand the pathophysiological mechanisms behind constipation, broadly differentiated in your head into anorectal evacuation and uh, colonic transit problems. Okay. So now uh, Harrison tells that the definition, definition of Harrison basically says three per week, less than three per week is the definition of constipation, but that's not the only criteria that is required for constipation. You require many other things, which is, per, which is also a persistent, difficult, infrequent, or seemingly incomplete edification. Okay, so this is the definition of constipation along with this. So both together will come under the definition of constipation. So the constipation, like I told you, most of the cause of constipation are primary. That means they're functional disorder. But the meaning of functional does not mean the patient's symptoms are any lesser than the secondary causes. They're more difficult for the doctor to find. So it's more debilitating for the patient who's going to have a lot of problems. And always remember that if you if the long standing untreated primary constipation will lead to secondary constipation it will lead to ulcers rectoceles prolapse etc so it will lead to a problem which was beginning very invisible so called invisible but suddenly becomes visible because of complications then you will think that the problem is due to the ulcer itself and treat the ulcer or treat the constipation uh, treat the rectocele or the uh, prolapse but the problem will not resolve because the primary problem to begin with primary constipation itself so a lot of 60% uh, of the patients have normal colonic transit. That itself says that the transit is normal. Okay. So um, based on how the transit is, we classify whether the patients have a slow transit or a rapid transit. A slow transit, uh, a patient with a slow transit is going to have hard pellety stools because like I told, colon is going to reabsorb all the sodium and water and make the stool hard. So any patient, no matter what the cause is, if the transit is very slow, or if, the, if the stool has not gone out of the um, uh, colon, then the stool is going to become hard. Okay. But 
that's not the case for rectal and anorectal disorders rectal mucosa is unable to reabsorb sodium and uh, water as compared to colon colonic mucosa is able to res uh, uh, reabsorb but not the anorectal region so colonic transit if it is slow then everything gets reabsorbed because the stool is staying there and that leads to hard stools the opposite happens in rapid transit when there's rapid movement there's not enough time for the water and uh, uh, sodium to get reabsorbed so everything just flushes down into the anorectal region and gets evacuated that comes out almost as loose tools like bristol five six and seven so that comes out as a diarrheal component so slow transit is what we are going to talk about today rapid transit is the next class which is diarrhea okay so slow transit or normal transit like i told you normal transit was more common 60 percent according to harrison's so normal transit and slow transit is what we are going to talk about with respect to colonic mucosa col uh, colonic transit okay so like i told you constipation can be understood in colonic transit problems or anorectal evacuation problems so transit or evacuation so if it is colonic transit it can be normal or it can be slow transit it can be normal transit or it can be slow transit if the patient has slow transit then there will be no urge in the patient so slow transit please note down slow transit has no urge okay if the patient says i feel like going but i'm unable to go but nothing is happening i'm not straining also that means it's a slow transit problem so slow transit patients don't have any urge okay but patients with anorectal disorders will have a lot of urge patient of anorectal disorders the colonic transit is normal so they feel like something is going to happen and rectal uh, rectal uh, stool has been accumulated everything is coming down and accumulated but he is unable to defecate any further so that is because of a puborectalis or a levetrani problem or the anorectal problem itself sphincter problem itself but not the colonic problem so in in the case of anorectal junction anorectal uh, disorders there will be a lot of urge the patient is going to strain badly the patient is going to have pain the patient is prone to have a lot of uh, sphincter spasms ulcers prolapse etc and most importantly in a colonic transit in a colonic transit there is nothing in the rectum it's an empty rectum because this colon has not moved there's nothing in the rectum so if you do a pr examination or the patient tries to digitally evacuate there is nothing that is going to come out because there is nothing in the rectum whereas the patient himself says if i use my finger to stimulate the anorectal region or the posterior wall of, wall of the vagina lot of stools are present in the anorectal region so that gets stimulated and then gets released out so digital evacuation straining a secondary problems that are happening because of the constipation is more likely due to an anorectal evacuation disorder than due to a colonic transit disorder okay so colonic transit disorder has no urge the patient just doesn't feel like he's going to uh, pass stools but whenever he passes stool it is going to be hard stools that is because the colonic uh, uh, stools in the colon have uh, gotten their water and reabsorbed completely and they become hard because of time factor but straining anorectal digital evacuation etc are features of an anorectal evacuation disorder okay now that's what the last line also says Features suggesting an evacuation disorder, such as a high anal sphincter tone, failure of the perineal descent, paradoxical puborectalis contraction, or puborectalis tenderness during the PR, all uh, are a feature of a anorectal disorder. Okay, so this is what you have to understand. Now, in Harrison's, he has mentioned about the broad causes, which are recent onset and chronic. Like I told you, we are here to talk about chronic. Why? That is because re recent onset are all, look at the look at the causes, that neoplasm, stricture, diverticula, ischemia, anal fissure, painful hemorrhage, all are easy to diagnose. They are all easily visible. Okay. So, they are, you and you know also, the patient will tell you, one week ago, I had, I started this problem. The patient is able to discern it. So, therefore, it is acute. If the patient is able to tell you when it started, it is acute. If the patient is unable to tell you when it is started, then it is called as insidious. Or the patient has done a lot of other adaptations on himself so that the problem doesn't occur. So that is called as insidious. So the insidious symptoms are basically invariably chronic and hence they're more difficult to diagnose. So in that you have irritable bowel syndrome, medications, colonic pseudo obstruction. Please mind you that this is colonic pseudo obstruction very important because Harrison's mentions in other chapters that there's some, there is intestinal soda obstruction. When there is intestinal soda obstruction, they're more often than not talking about small intestinal problems. If they're telling only soda obstruction, you have to think of that whether they're talking about intestinal or colonic. In colonic soda obstruction, you're going to have uh, a problem in the colon, obviously. 
Whereas in intestinal pseudo obstruction, if there's a pseudo obstruction, you have to classify whether it is colonic or intestinal. Here we are going to talk only about colonic because constipation can be only due to a problem in the colonic or in the anorectal regions. Small intestine is very rare. So colonic pseudo obstruction, basically your OGLV syndrome, is basically due to a slow transit constipation. Obviously, they can be due to megacolon or the neural problems. Basically, a neuromyopathies of the colon where the propulsion is not happening. Your 75 mm Hg hapses are not being formed, like I told you before. Then you have endocrinopathies, hypothyroidism, very common, hypercalcemia, and pregnancy, psychiatric disorders like depression, eating disorders, and drugs. Neurological causes like Parkinsonism, multiple sclerosis, or spinal cord injury, very important, and generalized muscle disease like sclerosis, systemic sclerosis. So these are all the causes that are chronic. Now, look at this one, which is disorders of rectal evacuation. All these causes were probably mostly colonic with a secondary anorectal problem, but disorders of rectal evacuation are an anorectal evacuation disorder. So in these patients, urge is a very important symptom. Straining is a very important symptom. So these patients are due to uh, pelvic floor dysfunction, anismus, where there is a, there's a high tone of the sphincter. Descending peri perineum syndrome. I told you the perineum will descend to more than 4 cm from the bony landmark. So it will balloon out. So because the per perineum is ballooning out during straining, there is not enough pressure for the in the rectum. So the stool doesn't come out. If the perineum comes out a large amount, that is called as perineum ballooning or descending perineum syndrome. Or if the patient does not have enough, if the perineum doesn't descend enough itself, it less less than 1.5 centimeter from the bony landmarks, it descends. So it descends very less. So if it doesn't descend also, there is a problem in rectal evacuation. So both inadequate descent and excessive descent are problems of the anorectal evacuation. So this is called as de descending perineum syndrome, rectal mucosal prolapse and rectocele. So rectocele and rectal prolapse are all cause of disorders of rectal evacuation or anorectal evacuation disorders, which have a lot of urgent straining and need for digital evacuation. Okay. So these are the causes according to Harrison's, which is recent onset and chronic. But what is chronic? So in these patients of chronic, chronic constipation, you need to differentiate between chronic constipation. So what is the timeline? According to Rome for criteria, it is more than three months. Okay. More than three months is called as chronic. Some places have also mentioned more than four weeks, it's like slicinger. But you should remember that uh, there are both these values given. More than three months is what is, we are talking about primary constipation. So chronic constipation can be divided into, we, Harrison's basically divided into recent and chronic. Recent is because of hemorrhoids, etc., um, uh, anal tears, tags. There could be uh, problems like uh, uh, stricture or diverticulitis or some kind of a neoplasm, etc. A simple colonoscopy or simple blood test will tell you what the issue is. That is called as a recent onset. Now, chronic onset is basically divided into two problems. One, I told you, is a colonic transit problem. So, in colonic transit problem, you're going to have two things. One is a normal transit constipation, normal transit, and you're going to have slow transit constipation okay so you're going to have two types normal con transit constipation and slow transit constipation okay now this is colonic transit problems so in normal transit problem which is the most common type okay most of them are 60 percent so here what is going to happen is the colon is able to have normal propulsions normal segmentations but yet you're going to have some kind of a constipation so this is mostly similar to ibsc but not the same as ibsc IBS is irritable bowel, irritable bowel syndrome, constipation variant or mixed variant it could be. This most of them will look like IBS. Okay. But what is the most important symptom difference between IBS proper and normal transit constipation is the abdominal pain. In IBS, you are going to have a patient who is going to talk about abdominal pain very badly. Whereas in normal transit constipation, the patient talks about abdominal pain very less or he's going to talk about it as a last symptom or a negative symptom when you ask he'll say yes yes it's there so it's not debilitating enough so abdominal pain is less than normal transit constipation but both of them are a problem of the brain gut axis you can classify them as due to some kind of a functional disorder proper functional disorder now in slow transit constipation so you are going to have two things one important thing is that the patient is not able to generate good amount of hapses that is high amplitude propulsive contraction they're less than 75 and there's not going to be inadequate propulsion so all the stools are loaded in the colon itself somewhere in the ascending and the transverse colon or probably descending also so all the colon is lying here only okay so if you take an x-ray you can find loaded colon over here that is slow transit constipation in a patient who is having slow transit constipation there is not going to be any urge 
stool movements will be less than three per week. This is slow transit. This is colonic transit problems. Okay. Now we're going to have anorectal evacuation problems. In anorectal evacuation problems, you are going to have a problem in the anorectal region. So this, these patients are going to be either a primary issue, which is called as dyssynergic defecation. So in dyssynergic defecation, basically what happens is normally when the rectum is full of stools, after it reaches a certain degree of pressure, the rectal wall is sensed that leads to the afferent nerves going to the spinal cord and spinal cord will give a efferent signal to uh, for the rectum to increase its pressure and propels it, propel the stool out. Then the internal anal sphincter will relax and voluntarily external anal sphincter will relax if the place and the uh, 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 situation is correct. So external anal sphincter will relax and that leads to propulsion. So during rectal pressure, during an increased rectal pressure to ex excrete the stools, the internal anal and external anal sphincter has to relax. If during the uh, rectal pressure, if the internal anal sphincter also is contracting, then both of them are contracting. So nothing comes out. That is called as dyssynergic defecation. So there's a difference between the synergy of the rectum and the internal anal sphincter. That is called as dyssynergic defecation. So dyssynergic defecation is the problem between the rectum, rectal pressure and the sphincter pressure. Both should be opposite. So rectum will increase the pressure that will cause the stools to start moving down and the sphincter has to relax. So this move goes out. So if there's a discordance between the rectum and the sphincter, it is called as dyssynergic defecation. So there is no, no it's, it's normal because there are no other causes found. So it's kind of some kind some some kind of a primary disorder. Secondary disorders probably could be due to a rectocele, rectocele prolapse of the rectum. It could be descending perineum syndrome. Descending perineum syndrome. These are a few of the causes that can be there. Please mind it that rectocele prolapse, descending perineum syndrome, all of these are anorectal disorders presenting as chronic constipation. This is opposite to what we call as a, a recent onset when you have a hemorrhoid. Hemorrhoid also is present in the inner sphincter, let us say a tear in the inner sphincter. These are all going to be recent onset. They're detectable easily. Whereas these are not detectable easily. They only are presenting during the patient during when the patient is actually defecating. If you do a, 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 a proctoscopy, you will not be able to find any abnormality, no tears, no ulcers, nothing. But all of these are going to be, have a normal looking anorectal uh, uh, um, region, but only during defecation, there's going to be a problem. During defecation, there'll be a prolapse. So that leads to chronic constipation. So this is a general overview of what Harrison's and to a part of other uh, literature is talking about how to classify constipation. So primarily to summarize, constipation is recent onset or chronic onset. Recent onset are basically are all causes that are detectable easily. Chronic constipation is di di differentiated into colonic transit problems and anorectal problems. So then you will have three types, which is NTC, normal transit constipation, slow transit constipation, and DSD or dyssynergic defecation or anorectal evacuation problems. So these are all evacuation problems. So these are three subheadings under which we classify cons chronic constipation, normal transit, slow transit, and anorectal evacuation problems. Okay, so this is what we have to understand. These three things are most important and this is the uh, uh, crux of the entire session today. So acute is less than one week, chronic is more than four weeks or it can be three months. Three months is what mentioned in Harrison's. Okay, chronic constipation is basically patient describes to have constipation for more than three months. That is what this is the exact statement from Harrison's. I have told both of them because here they're telling patient describes the constipation to be for more than three months. We know that whatever patient describes need not be the actual reality. That means there could be a subjective complaint or a perceived constipation. So chronic constipation is anything that is present for more than four weeks truly or whatever the patient is telling that is there for more than three months. Okay, that is chronic constipation. Now, that's what, like I told you, constipation prevalence is high when self-reported. But and it is low when the Rome criteria is applied. And this Rome criteria is going to be uh, how we define functional constipation. So Rome 4 criteria is going to be applied here. Chronic constipation is now divided, we told you, prim uh, primary and secondary. Primary is basically because of normal transit constipation or idiopathic, which is 60%. And then you have slow transit constipation and DSD. These three are primary constipations. So these primary constipations are basically from the Rome criteria. They have to fulfill the Rome criteria for you to go ahead with primary 
constipation criteria. Secondary co constipation, the patient is going to have some kind of drugs, endocrinopathies, diabetes, neurological problems, mechanical problems, and intestinal soda obstruction. So intestinal soda obstruction comes under secondary causes. Please note that intestinal soda obstruction is not a disorder of functional constipation. Functional constipation is different. Intestinal soda obstruction is different. Don't put them under the same thing just because the word pseudo is present. Pseudo intestinal soda obstruction is secondary, whereas primary you have only three: NTC, STC, and DSD or anorectal evacuation. Okay, so this is the uh, classification. And mind you, that functional constipation is nothing but primary constipation, which has to fulfill the Rome 4 criteria. So, a Rome 4 criteria is basically um, a functional constipation, basically, has the patient has to have two or more of the following 25% of the time, the patient is, have, is training. 25% of the time, more than 25% of the time, patient has a lumpy or a hard stool. More than 25% of the time, patient has an incomplete evacuation. More than 25% of the time, patient has an anorectal obstruction or blockage requiring defecatory means, like basically digital evacuation support of the pelvic floor in more than 25% of the time. So these things, fewer, more, fewer than more than three, uh, fewer than three stool bowel movements, basically less than three per week. We've already discussed. This should be there. Loose tools are rarely present without the use of laxatives and insufficient criteria for irritable bowel syndrome. It's insufficient because abdominal pain will come off here. Here you don't have abdominal pain. Abdominal pain is not present here. Okay. So if any of these two, more than two of these are there, more than two of these are there, we call it as functional constipation provided you have ruled out recent constipation, you have ruled out secondary causes of all this is only when you have ruled out these causes. Please note down. If you have ruled out these causes only, then you can go ahead with primary. But primary is definitely more common than everything else. And primary is divided into three types. And primary is only called as functional. Okay. Primary constipation is also called as functional constipation. And it is ful fulfilling the Rome 4 criteria after ruling out secondary causes. Drugs, endocrinopathies, hypercalcemia, metabolic disturbance, malignancy, neuromyopathies, genetic disorders, all these have to be ruled out. Intestinal pseudo obstruction has to be ruled out. It's very important. Intestinal pseudo obstruction means basically due to metabolic disturbances like hypokalemia. Okay. So here, this patient, like I told you, has divided into three types, NTC, STC, DSD. So NTC is basically 60% of the cases where the treatment you can give is basically stimulation. So you can give fibers or stimulant laxatives. You can go ahead and start treating them as functional constipation by giving some kind of a drugs that are more like SSRI and TCAs. You can give them CBT and biofeedback. Biofeedback, very important. It's very effective in these patients. Slow transit constipation, they're mostly present. These are picked up directly from Harrison's. Young women, onset at puberty and less than one bowel movement per week. They're young women presenting at pubertal onset. They can have abdominal pain, but it's not the primary thing. They can have bloating. Their gastrocolic reflex is blunted. So gastrocolic reflex means what? As soon as you eat, within the next few minutes, uh, within the next half an hour, 30, 30 to an about one hour, you are going to feel the need to defecate. This is normal. So in these patients, even if you make them or ask them to uh, uh, evacuate, they'll be unable to do so because their gastro reflex has been blunted. Gastrocolic reflex has been blunted. So slow transit constipation is basically blunted gastrocolic reflex. The movement is completely minimal. So that the severe form of which is called as colonic inertia. The word used in Harrison is colonic inertia. So basically here, there is going to be urge that is going to be decreased. Your bowel sounds is going to be less heard very less in such patients. Okay, dyssynergic defecations is basically present in older men. You compare to younger women here, the older men, they have structural issues like rectocele, intersusception, descending perineal syndrome and prolapse. But they are present only mostly during when the patient is trying to defecate and not otherwise. Why is it important to identify these patients? That is because these lead to secondary problems like ulcers, prolapse and other secondary causes. They can itself lead to a secondary colonic, slow colonic transit. So basically, you have the ascending and the transverse. These two areas, like I told you in the starting of the slide, ascending and transverse are going to have, are basically non-volitional reservoir. Do you remember? Ascending and transverse colon are reservoirs. They're non-volitional and they take 15 hours for one stool to pass through the entire spectrum of the uh, intestine. 
So if the problem is lying over here, is the problem in the uh, ascending and the transverse, it could be either normal transit more than more than slow transit. So normal uh, transit colon, uh, normal uh, colonic, uh, normal transit uh, constipation basically is a problem mostly restricted in the ascending and the transverse, but not in the descending. So if it's a problem in the entire colon itself, that is mostly slow transit constipation. Okay. And if it's a problem in the anorectal, sigmoid anorectal problem, then we probably say it's anorectal evacuation in which you have DSD. This is DSD. So DSD is very important because they are going to cause ulcers and strictures here. They're going to bleed here if the problem is more. Okay. This AE, if the, if the anorectal evacuation disorder is very un, much untreated, it will lead to a secondary slow colonic transit. It will lead to a secondary colonic transit. Slow. This is very important at this point for you to understand this. So please, please, please try to understand that if you are having a anorectal disorder, if it is untreated and severe, it is going to slow the colonic transit itself. Up till now, we thought that the anorectal disorder problems and the colonic transit problems were separate. But now I'm telling you that an untreated severe anorectal disorder, evacuation disorder is going to cause a secondary colonic transit to slow down. So if you're doing any studies to assess the colonic transit, like a colonic transit study, you might find it slowed. If you find it slowed, that does not mean that there is no anorectal problem. Correct? So colonic transit studies can be present up as abnormal even in anorectal disorders. So if at the onset of your history taking, if you elicit training, urge and uh, digital evacuation need in constipation, that all those symptoms will point towards an anorectal evacuation disorder. If you find them first, then you are going to do a anorectal manometry as the test to begin with. Or to screen them, you need to do a balloon expulsion test. I'll repeat it again. If you are finding symptoms of urge, usage of digital evacuation, and if you're having a lot of straining and hard stools, these all point towards a anorectal evacuation disorder. If you find the perineum is very heavy, if you find the perineum is ballooning in your PR, if you find that there is a high resting sphincter tone, if you find hard stools in the rectum loaded, all these will point towards an anorectal evacuation disorder. And these symptoms, if they're present in the other symptoms of constipation as a primary thing, then you are going to do a balloon expulsion test to screen the patient for an evacuation disorder and then confirm with anorectal manometry. But mind it that if you ha don't have these symptoms as a predominant symptom, you're just going to have the patient to say, I'm having hard stools. I'm not straining. I don't have urge. And I just pass uh, once in a week or once in two weeks only I pass. I have very few uh, little bloating. I have little abdominal pain, but I don't have problems of urge, straining or digital evacuation need. I don't have. If the patient is complaining of these symptoms, then it's likely to be a colonic transit problem. If it's a colonic transit problem, then this first test that you do is a colonic transit study. But colonic transit study can be secondarily slowed in a severe untreated anorectal evacuation disorder also. Okay. All the points that I have blurted out now are all present in Harrison's. So please understand that these topics are not present somewhere in another textbook. They're all present in Harrison's. If if you are reading, if you're understanding all these points, if you go back to Harrison's and read constipation, you'll understand that all these points have been hidden in those wordings. So please understand that these uh, intricacies are important and very much present in um, Harrison's. Okay. So like I told you, prolonged straining. What are the clinically relevant questions at history? Prolonged straining, hard lumps, heavy perineum, digital manipulation are all features of an anorectal evacuation disorder or DSD. These are important for you to identify because the screening test becomes balloon expulsion test and then confirmed by anorectal manometry. If, if it's not this, then you do a colonic transit study first. Urge to pass tools is a very, very infrequent in slow transit constipation, obviously, because colonic is colon is not moving, there'll be no urge. Whereas is normal in NTC and DSD. Okay. In DSD, there is a paradoxical contraction of the anal sphincter with the Rectal pressure also increasing in attempt to defecate. During attempt to defecation only, these problems will come. If you find the patient, if you do all the tests during when the patient is normally lying without no uh, constipatory maneuvers, I mean, defecatory maneuvers, then probably you will not be able to identify these problems. So type of functional constipation, slow transit, there is no urge. 
we are going to do a colonic st transit study as the first test. This is most commonly done by an X-ray method, mostly Hinto method. Okay, I'll come to it. If uh, if you're having a normal transit or a DSD, by history, if you're having a DSD, then it's very important that you see that the urge is present. So those patients are only more having anorectal problems. There is a lot of strain and a heavy perineum also that is present. In these patients, anorectal manometry and balloon expulsion to be done first. First, you'll do balloon expulsion test because it's easy and it's a screening method. And then you confirm with uh, objective anorectal manometry. So in a constipation patient, it is important to understand the physiology, colonic motility, anorectal difficulty reflex, then come and understand what is primary, what is secondary. In primary, you will apply Rome criteria. After Rome criteria, you will come to know that it is functional. In functional, you will find out if an urge is present or not. If urge is present and all those symptoms, like I told you, are present, they're mostly DSD, then you'll go for balloon expulsion test and then by ARM. If there is no urge and if you find that the patient is not having any symptoms of uh, uh, straining and uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, um, uh, normal transit constipation are present, then you will say that the patient is having normal transit constipation. Okay. So in those patients, you're going to do balloon expulsion test. Okay. So this is what you understand. So, after knowing all this, let's ask a question. So, in this question, uh, you have a 43-year-old man who is presenting with difficulty passing stools. And a lot of straining is present. Okay. So, a lot of straining is present in these patients for more than nine months. So, definitely crossing over three months cutoff. There is no blood in stool or abdominal pain, no diarrhea or weight loss and often needs to use his finger to stimulate defecation. No drugs or other systemic issues, and blood test and x-ray is normal, barring loaded stools in the lower abdominal region. What is the next step in the diagnosis amongst the options given below? So now you have to use our existing knowledge. Now it is more than three months. Nothing has been found out. So the patient is going to fit into chronic constipation and not recent onset. So this is chronic constipation. So now you see, the patient has difficulty passing stools, obviously, so it must be less than three per week. He's having lumpy stools and a lot of straining is present. So straining is present. There is no abdominal pain, blood or stool. So secondary causes are unlikely. No drugs are there. No systemic issues are there. So it's mostly a primary disorder. So you have to apply Rome 4 criteria. So when you use the Rome 4 criteria, if you're going to get positive, it's functional constipation. So you need more than two of the symptoms of straining, evacuation, digital manipulation. So he is saying that he is... Uh, um, he often needs to use his finger to stimulate defecation. So he's using his digital, digital manipulation is present. So it most likely to be due to functional constipation. So in functional constipation, you have three types, NTC, STC, and DSD. Of these, look at the symptoms. There is training. There is digital evacuation that is required. Okay. And there are no abdominal pains uh, present in the patient. So this looks like probably a DSD but we couldn't, can't be sure about it unless we do a screening test. So screening test for DSD is balloon expulsion test and then followed by ARM. But none of them are present in the answer. After this, you can do a defecography also to confirm in some cases. In normal transit constipation, you can't do anything. You can do only a colonic uh, transit study first for both of these. If the transit study is normal, then you'll call it normal transit constipation. If it's abnormal, then you'll call it slow transit. This can be followed to confirm by a colonic manometry if you want. Okay, so but none of these are present. So what is the answer for this patient? Is it colonic transit study? But the patient is also having digital evacuation results required and stools are loaded in the lower abdomen. So it looks like a DSD by history, but we don't have the option. So what is the answer to this question? So the answer to this question comes from the Harrison's algorithm, which says the first thing that you need to do in chronic constipation is blood tests, which were normal in our patient. Abdominal x-ray also was done, but nothing was done. Next thing you need to do is exclude mechanical obstruction, even in chronic obstruction. Even in chronic constipation, you have to do a colonoscopy because now you can't rely on completely on history alone. So you will start with the colonoscopy, rule out the problems in the mucosa, lumen, everything, and then you proceed with colonic transit. So Harrison says colonic transit to be done after all ruling out all the basic stuff. You move to colonic transit as the first study. But I've already told you that in colonic transit studies, in patients with anorectal evacuation disorder, secondarily also, they will have colonic uh, slowing. So doing a colonic study will be of no use. So 
even though colonic study is first here and then if you get slow colonic uh, transit you're going to say uh, there is some kind of a slow colonic uh, constipation if it's a known disorder you treat if it's not known then you do an anorectal manometry and balloon expulsion they're doing it after colonic study okay now if the colonic study is normal we call it as normal transit constipation then you consider functional bowel disease similar to ibsc similar to ibsc not not the same as ibsc so here what i'm trying to tell you is there's a controversy so first if the symptoms are more suggestive if you take good history harrison tells you in the next paragraph since evacuation disorders also retard colonic transit through the left colon or the entire colon anorectal and pelvic floor testing should precede should precede transit measurements if there is clinical suspicion of an evacuation disorder this clinical suspicion of evacuation disorder is on, is what we know now as urge straining digital evacuation etc loaded colons in pr high sphincter in high uh, anal sphincter tone etc all these are present if you feel like it's mostly an anorectal evacuation disorder you will do the opposite otherwise you will follow this algorithm if nothing is present that is pointing towards an anorectal evacuation issue then you will do colonic transit first and then prm if you find the symptoms and pr examination for uh, uh, issues to suggest of suggestive of dsd or an anorectal issues then you do bet first and then colonic transit okay even in slicinger i'm mentioning it out of harrison's even in slicinger they have mentioned anorectal manometry to be done first in their algorithms colonic transit studies comes later on only in harrison's he has mentioned colonic transit in the starting and then anorectal manometry in the next okay so uh, this is the controversy but harrison's please understand in the algorithm he might mention colonic transit first but textually he is told properly that if the symptoms and clinical examination pr findings suggest a uh, evacuation disorder then please do bet first and not colonic transit study could colonic a slow colonic transit does not necessarily mean that uh, uh, anorectal disorders are not there okay now harrison's mentioned the word idiopathic constipation i just want to clarify the meaning of idiopathic constipation is ntc normal transit constipation basically it's a functional constipation only still so it's the uh, patient's delayed emptying of the ascending and transverse you remember i told you ascending and transverse where the problem is in the reservoir okay so it is going to be affected in trans uh, in idiopathic constipation ascending and transverse colon the propulsive hapses are lost that is a normal transit constipation okay uh, outlet obstruction disorders are basically nothing but evacuation disorders outlet is gone so in the last part only okay now um we finished primary secondary causes i just want to tell calcium channel blockers are important you might think calcium channel blockers are always related to something like uh, um, used in relaxation vasodilatation in achalasia you are using it to relax the lower lower esophageal sphincter so basically calcium channel is associated with the idea that something is going to become big and relaxed but in constipation it's not the case ccb is going to cause retardation in the colonic propulsion and hence leads to a secondary cause of constipation anticholinergics very important in patients of parkinsons we are using it it causes uh, it causes decrease in uh, parasympathetic activity leading to constipation then you are also going to have antidepressants and opioids also and important in opioids in palliative care we are going to use so much of opioids in opioids you are not supposed to give fibers please understand harrison's also have, has told this i'll bring it up in the next uh, slide but fibers are not supposed to be used in chronic opioid uh, uh, therapy or cot therapy in that cases you are going to use um, a, a combination of both uh, 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 stimulant and osmotic okay both you're going to use okay not single hypothyroidism diabetes scleroderma parkinsons of this please note hypothyroidism and diarrhea diabetes alone okay i will tell you why but people watching this video please understand this hypothyroidism and diabetes please note that i have mentioned this very specifically at this point i'll bring it up later okay so hypothyroidism and diabetes causes secondary constipation okay now hyper secondary constipation i'm just stressing on what is supposed to be stressed then uh, hypercalcemia and hypokalemia hypokalemia is one of the causes of ogilv syndrome basically in uh, colonic pseudo obstruction okay then uh, cns disorders you can you have something called as supraconal especially in myelopathy and uh, spinal cord issues you have supraconal and infraconal bowel i will talk about this in the next class when i'm talking about fecal incontinence but supraconal bowel is basically a umn type of a bowel infraconal bowel is basically like an lmn type of a bowel here the anal tone is very lax anal tone is very loose so it, everything comes out basically it's a, it's more of a cause of fecal incontinence okay whereas umn the anal tone is very high so the patient is going to not be able to relax the uh, uh, anal tone so in that cases it's going to lead to constipation basically an anorectal constipation okay so these are all the causes of secondary type of constipation 
So at the end, we are taking a history. Now, if you understood the concepts properly, please understand any, any patient with constipation, don't ask questions that don't have any meaning. So in constipation, first you will ask duration. Duration of constipation will make a sense, make sense because three months is important here. Okay. So after that, you will ask about red flag signs. Okay. Like blood, anemia, weight loss. Okay. Abdominal pain, upper GI problems, bleeding, all, all these things, basically. Okay. These are all red flags and that don't suggest a primary issue. It consists of a secondary issue. So if it's not recent onset, that means it is less than three months. Uh, you're, you're going to consider chronic constipation. So in that case, you are not only going to ask whether the constipation is perceived constipation. Perceived constipation is what the patient comes and tells. You have to confirm that it is actually objective constipation. Okay. By asking two questions. One is frequency and then consistency. Frequency less than three stool bowel movements per week is constipation. Consistency, you're going to use the Bristol stool scale and assess which type of stool. One and two usually refers to constipation because they're hard and lumpy. After that, you will ask one of the most important questions, urge, strain and digital evacuation. Urge, strain and difficult, uh, uh, digital evacuation uh, will all point towards a problem in the anorectal region, anorectal evacuation disorder. In that case, you're going to do a balloon expulsion test if you have ruled out all the secondary causes of hypothyroidism, diabetes, drugs, etc. Okay. W one of the most important things that you need to ask is a history of sexual abuse. Okay. Urinary incontinence because most of the patients of uh, fecal incontinence have urinary incontinence also. So you have to ask sexual abuse, urinary and fecal incontinence and encopresis. Encopresis is basically a pediatric type of a, 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 a fecal incontinence. Now, why I'm telling fecal incontinence is, is because fecal incontinence is a topic that mostly is dealt with the diarrhea uh, spectrum. But let me tell you that if in a case of a, a, a element type of a bowel, when there's a lot of stools that are loaded in the anorectal region, the stools will become so heavy and they'll become so uh, loaded that secondarily it will cause a sphincter uh, dysfunction and that might lead to laxity in the sphincter and then fecal incontinence. But that doesn't mean that the patient has uh, fecal incontinence. So the patient it just means that the constipation is so severe that everything is getting let out very easily. So fecal incontinence also can be present in a very minor subset of severe constipation patients mostly in the uh, slow uh, mostly in any type of uh, any type of chronic constipation fecal incontinence can be present okay you are going to ask about dietary dietary history because obviously fiber diet is very important we recommend for 15 to 25 grams of uh, uh, per day of fiber in any patient of constipation you are going to ask medication history obstetric example forceps use that leads to a, some kind of a anal or an anorectal problems or a perineal problem that leads to a lax perineum that might lead to a uh, anorectal disorder Prolonged straining, hard lumps, heavy perineum, digital manipulation are all features suggestive of dysenergic defecation, DSD or uh, anorectal evacuation disorder. Now, some, like I told you, application of pressure in the posterior wall of vagina, supporting the perineum during straining and excessive straining all mean that there's an anorectal disorder. Okay. Urge to pass stool again is a problem. It's a very infrequent in stone, uh, uh, slow transit, and it's very important and normal in and very, actually very high in DSDs. Okay. So, um, fever, bleeding, painful defecation, weight loss, family history mixed with diarrhea, mucoid defecate all suggest a secondary process. Uh, that's very important. Okay. So these are the important points that you need to ask in history, especially if you're having a patient who's having again and again constipation, it's not resolved. Please don't send the patient back with fibers and go because fibers are con contraindicated in a very important type of uh, uh, constipation, which is anorectal evacuation. In anorectal evacuation, if you find all these uh, clubbed symptoms together, fibers are usually contraindicated in anorectal disorders because you can't keep giving fibers and then simulate everything and nothing will go out. That will lead to uh, ulcers and uh, uh, whatnot. So a Anorectal disorders are important for you to identify because of the symptoms characteristically they are present with and the consequences that they have. Okay. So this sheet becomes very important in a patient with chronic constipation. Okay. Uh, like I told you, colonic transit study is done in a patient of uh, uh, who doesn't have urge. You're going to di differentiate into uh, normal transit and slow transit. The uh, Harris, this is entirely taken from Harrison's. In colonic transit study, you're going to put uh, orally radio op opaque markers uh, for five days. And then after five days, you're going to first you're going to take a scout film. A scout film is a film without any radio opaque markers, nothing. It's a normal baseline uh, x ray. After uh, giving the radio opaque markers, you're going to give five days later, you're going to take the next x ray. 80% of all the amount of colonic markers, suppose you have put uh, uh, 20, 30 colonic markers, 80% of them should have exited the colon. 
if it has not exited or more than 20 percent has remained in the colon or in the inorectal region that means there is some kind of constipation okay this is called as hintos method this is the most common x-ray method there is no radiation there's nothing if you want to be even more specific and if you want to identify a disorder look at this if you want to identify a disorder in the gastric small bowel also which might lead to a general because of a general neuromyopathies uh, then you can do a radio scintigraphy also a radio scintigraphy is going to detect a generalized gi problem and not just a colonic problem but if you show that there is no upper gi complex complaints or there's no gastric or small intestinal problem, then you can restrict yourself to a Hintos method colonic uh, transit study. This is the x-ray that you take after five days. You, you can take a baseline scout film. Probably this is a scout film. Now, after five days, you're going to put radio opaque markers. So radio opaque markers will appear as white rings like this. So uh, you, you take a line along the uh, midline in the spine, and then you're going to uh, put one line over here uh, intersecting at the L5 uh, towards the brim of the uh, pe uh, pelvis on the left side and uh, intersecting the uh, scale spine on the left right side so when you do this you're going to have three quadrants over here uh, if the uh, 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 radio pick markers are present uh, throughout the whole uh, films all three quadrants is basically slow transit constipation more than 20 percent is remaining at the end of five days that means it's constipation if it's remaining throughout everywhere then it is probably slow transit if as everything is exited and nothing is present then it is normal transit but if everything nothing is there over here okay nothing is there over here but everything is accumulated here at the end so accumulation of radio pick markers or in a normal x-ray also if you find a lot of gas in this region just below the scale spines at the level of scale spines if you find all the markers to be concentrated here then it's more of a anorectal evacuation disorder okay or a dsd if it's primary okay so this is a colonic transit study so if you are having a lot of urge strain symptoms, you'll do a screening balloon expulsion test where you're going to take an inflate a Foley's catheter or something like that. You're going to put 50 ml of water and then you're going to ins uh, you're going to insert the Foley's catheter into the rectum and then inflate it with 50 ml of water. After some, after within one minute, the patient has to defecate. If it doesn't defecate within one minute, if the expulsion does not happen, that means there is some kind of an anorectal manometry disorder. In the lateral position, if you're doing the same test, you're going to measure the weight, okay, that is probably going to quantify. So weight is uh, measured, weight needed to facilitate expulsion is measured. Normally, expulsions occur within less than 200 grams added or unaided within one minute. Unaided, it will come out or less than 200 grams, if, uh, less than 200 grams weight is enough to cause expulsion. If it requires a lot of weight to cause expulsion, that means something is abnormal. So this is balloon expulsion test. If it's positive, then you do a anorectal manometry, which is basically a pressure. There are a lot of catheters placed, about 256 catheters, 100 catheters, uh, uh, transducers are present and you insert the transducer and measure the pressure during defecation also. Okay. Um, one of the important things is when you're doing a PR examination, the when the patient is supine and doing a PR ex examination, it is not the uh, usual lateral method. When the patient is supine and you're doing a, uh, you're going to do a PR. Once you do a PR, normally what happens? There is going to be a posterior uh, 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 tug of the. Uh, uh, puborectalis. During defecation when the patient strains, there's a posterior tug. But if it doesn't, if it moves paradoxically anteriorly upward towards the pubic, that means uh, puborectalis is contracting during defecation. I told you that during normal physiology, the puborectalis actually has to relax. But in uh, abnormal, uh, in DSD, especially in DSD, the, there's a paradoxical contraction anteriorly of the pu uh, uh, puborectalis that might be giving you a clue that this is some kind of a DSD. Okay, if the puborectalis moves anteriorly instead of being there or going down posteriorly. Okay, and like I told you, the perineal perineum descends downwards normally up to 1.5, it has to descend 1.5 to 4, it can descend 4 centimeter. Harrison says that if less than 1.5 is there, descent is there, an inadequ inadequate descent. If it's more than 4 centimeter, it is excessive descent. So both of these are problematic that both of them will lead to a secondary anorectal pressure to be decreased and causing anorectal evacuation disorder. Defecography is done in anorectal disorders once you have done manometry or it's inconclusive. Defecography can be done in two ways. One, you can do barium or one, you can do MRI. Now, barium is like very physiological because when you give barium orally, then you take a, uh, take the x-ray and then you ask the patient to x-ray and take the x-ray also. But this is a physiological where you're sitting on the, uh, you're, you're actually uh, simulating a normal physiological uh, defecation. But in MRI, the patient is supine. Okay, so difficography is not how it's supposed to be in the normal scenario where you're squatting and then pressurizing. So MRI is not that physiological, but barium is actually quite physiological. Okay, but what important here thing is the most common cause of outlet obstruction is DSD, which is failure of puborectalis mus muscle to relax, paradoxically contracting. This is DSD and it is considered to be the most common cause of an anorectal disorder primarily. 
So it is not identified in barium defecography. So DSD is not identified by barium defecography because of uh, uh, because of which MRI defecography is better in such patients. Okay, so that is a that is all about a normal testing. Um, in some patients, if a six to three to six month trial of all medical therapies fails, you're given your dietary fiber, TC, everything. STC, slow transit constipation, Harrison tells that it has to be diagnosed and treated aggressively. Okay, aggressively. So in this case, you're going to do a, a, a surgery. If you end up going to that severe stage, you can't have so much of constipation. You're going to do a surgery. The surgery is a lap colectomy with the iliorectostomy. Lap colectomy with the iliorectostomy. Sometimes they're going to decrease the amount of uh, tissue that they're going to remove also. There are variations in the surgery. But as mentioned in Harrison's, a lap colectomy with the iliorectostomy. Okay. Uh, this Otherwise, what happens, th th there should be no obstruction in this case. Please note that this should be unassociated with obstructive defecation. In those cases, you're going to do this. If the patient has a generalized GI motility, if there's gastroparesis, everything, you cannot do this test. That's why it's important for you to do a radiosyntigraphy, which picks up a lot of GI disorders. You've seen over here, radiosyntigraphy, I told you after chronic transit, if you feel like there's a generalized GI motility disorder, you're going to do a radiosyntigraphy or a gastric emptying studying also. Um, this is all about the STC, uh, surgery in STC, it might be required. Okay. Uh, DSD, importantly, will respond to something called as biofeedback. Again and again and again, it's been mentioned. I'm trying to uh, um, tell you that in a patient of DSD, especially uh, because this is a primary disorder, you please try something called as biofeedback. Now, DSD can obviously, uh, if it's severe enough, it will cause a secondary uh, slow transit constipation. This DSD, if you go and treat it with biofeedback, this STC will automatically come down. But if you wrongly identify this STC alone, if you don't identify the DSD, if you only identify the STC using colonic transit uh, X-ray or something, and you treat only this STC and go, the patient is not going to improve. So the, the patient is not going to have STC, which becomes severe. Medical therapy will fail. And what will you resort to? You will resort to the surgery, which is such a gross error. So in these cases, you should importantly understand that if you don't address this DSD, then you're at fault because DSD can cause secondarily STC. So DSD is important to identify. So how will you identify DSD? Because it's an anorectal evacuation disorder, you can be aided. You, you, physician has all the means to identify a DSD. By history, you can pick it up. You can pick it up by urge, training, secondary uh, ulcerations, etc. And using of usage of digital evacuation methods. If those are predominant in the constipation, apart from the frequency constipation uh, consistency criteria, apart from that, if these symptoms are predominant, that suggests a DSD. Once already history is suggesting of a DSD, you will go with a balloon expulsion screening and then do a inrectal manometry. If you want, you can do a defecography also. And you will do a MRI defecography because barium defecography does not identify DSD. Okay, so you do all these tests, identify a DSD, Treat the DSD, even if colonic slowing is there, you know that colonic slowing is due to the DSD itself. Treat the DSD using biofeedback. If the biofeedback also is not working, then even in DSDs, you're going to do colectomy and iliorectostomy, even in them. But please understand that biofeedback improves in a lot of patients, especially in a defecation disorder. It is working a lot. Whereas in normal transit study, biofeedback is probably working. CBT, TCA, SSRI, treatment of IBSC is more of an important uh, treatment algorithm. Biofeedback becomes important in uh, anorectal uh, evacuation disorders. So this is the general management of constipation. I am not going to things like what are the drugs and doses and everything because they are not conceptual. You can learn it by practicing, but attempting to understand constipation in these ways is important. So BOSS is algorithm to which you have to go through in chronic constipation. First, you will try bulk. Okay, which is basically fibers, then you'll go to osmotic, then you'll go to uh, stimulant, and then you'll go to secretory. So this is the order in which you move through, generally in constipation. But fibers are con contraindicated in DSD, fibers are contraindicated in opioid. That's why history of opioid therapy or cot therapy and history of uh, uh, DSD is very important for you to know because fibers should not be given in such patients. And in cot therapy, you will use a, a, a combination of two, either st st osmotic and uh, stool softness or uh, stool softness and... Uh, um, uh, uh, bisacodyl stimulants. Bisacodyl is extremely efficient. Bisacodyl, especially rectal suppository, bisacodyl is very efficiently uh, um, um, 
treating patients with constipation okay so uh, in summary you have uh, chronic constipation which is uh, more than 3 months once you have ruled out secondary causes including intestinal obstruction you divide into three parts normal transit constipation is most common where it's a functional disorder with ibsc similarity secondary causes has to be uh, tested uh, aggressively and you go to drug therapy with more of an ibs type of a treatment and uh, cbt and secondarily biofeedback whereas uh, in a patient with uh, a slow transit study there is no urge colonic transit study becomes the most important test screening test it's a neuromyogenic problem it can be uh, treatment is uh, neostigmine especially in neostigmine and pyridostigmine act selectively on the colon okay please note neostigmine and pyridostigmine are not important for the uh, upper uh, gi tract as much as lower tract they can be used but colonic stimulant it is basically neostigmine if all these are working and still nothing is happening you go ahead with the colectomy and ileorectal anastomosis provided that you have ruled out a dsd provided you have ruled out a dsd in slow transit if dsd is present you're going to have a certain symptom complex that obviously is due to outlet obstruction if it's primary and no cause is found it is called as dsd okay if some other causes like rectocele prolapse is found then it becomes secondary secondary enorectal disorders okay so dsd if it is present you 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 have to screen it if suspected you have to screen it with balloon expulsion and then followed up with manometry and defecography okay dsd needs biofeedback mainly please note and drugs are secondary okay and avoid fibers avoid fibers and constipation palliative care i have already told you 100% of the patients requiring palliative care will have constipation because of cord therapy chronic opioid therapy so chronic opioid therapy you have different eaton index eaton scale bowel function index can be used to assess the uh, problem that is there due to the opioid therapy on constipation fiber is contraindicated i have already told you and you have to use a combination combination of a stool softener and a laxative either stimulant or osmotic a combination therapy is given up front you, you know that the patient is going to take long term opioid therapy you give the opioid with the combination therapy don't wait for the problem to happen okay because in old patients in palliative patients they might not complain of the problem they'll end up in delirium or ulcer or some kind of an obstruction always so this is the overview of constipation this slide is very important but to understand this slide you need to go through the entire lecture go back and try to read harrison's because the way it has been presented is very very um, hidden uh, it needs a lot of effort for you to understand and uh, you need to go back and study the gi part and the cardinal manifestations part both together in the next session we'll be talking about diet and fecal incontinence um, and then move ahead with other symptoms. So if there's any doubts, I'll take them or uh, we can conclude this session. Thank you.